Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hope everybody have a good Tuesday. So with the social distancing rule relaxing, uh, hopefully everybody can can get out in a bit soon. So Marco and I will run some tours, which uh, he will explain at the end. Yeah. Oh, it's been raining these days. Though. It's good for the toad and frogs, right? Yeah, I went out on I went out on Saturday. I went to somewhere in Taipo and I went herping and some frogs, some snakes, but then never hiked through a typhoon. <laughs> And also, cause, and I came on pretty late and was soaking wet as well, so that was not a good experience. <laughs> okay, let's see. So we have 50 people sign up, so let's see how many turn up. Uh, it's a, apparently, it's a very popular talk. Uh, everybody wants to learn a little bit about insects, and I think we probably have some friends who are not from Hong Kong, right? Are you from Hong Kong, Charlotte? Kefri? You're from Hong Kong, okay. Uh, you, you can unmute yourself as well. Can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Is that microphone problem? Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're in Hong Kong. Hello. Hi. Evening, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. We have someone called Family's iPad. <laughs> Do I admit? Sorry. Come on. Oh. If you like herping or finding insects, uh, do find Marco or us. Um, uh, Marco is very good at finding, uh, I've been to Hoi Ha with him and he just find like beetles and butterfly and everything. He has a really good eye. So uh, I don't know how many of you uh, go out and uh, yeah, there's an app called iNaturalist as, as well. It's really good for uh, uh, finding animal and, and I think uh, Marco will explain in a bit. Yep. Yeah, it's really useful. Yeah, like to be honest, uh, I haven't been. Re I've started using it a bit more these days because I've got more time. Um, um, I think that yeah, because there's a few projects related to Hong Kong organisms, and sometimes I just scroll on there and just seeing a lot of people find different things. It's really, really, really amazing. And considering the size of Hong Kong and the amount of stuff you see, people finding is really something beautiful. Um, let me share something. Uh, this is a book called Tam Chong Gay, uh, for those who know Cantonese. Uh, and it's a local book with a lot of uh, insects pictures as well. So uh, uh, if you're interested, I would highly recommend this book as well. Uh, but uh, 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 it's somewhat transparent of, uh, due to the background. The oh, background. sorry. Oh, background. background. Wait, I, I think I have it because I don't have green screen. Just give me a sec. I thought Benita was actually <laughs> at the seaside. <laughs> Uh, this is a high hard picture. Sorry, sorry, my bad. This one. Uh, yeah, this is a book called Tam Chong Gay. So uh, it's, it has a lot of Hong Kong insects picture as well. I can't have it here. Can't see your face, Benita. Hi. Oh, sorry. You can't see my face. Oops. Oops. I'm so sorry. Oh. Here. <laughs> okay, we both have it. Better, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this book is called Tam Chong Gay, and it has really good uh, insects pic uh, picture as well. Unfortunately, it's Chinese. Oh, in Chinese. Uh, Tam Chong Gay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's written by the published by, by the, the film and uh, by the former director in the AFCD. So he wrote this book about all the insects and biology and it's really illustrated as well. So if you like a good insect book, I would really recommend this one. Uh, there are not many good books on Hong Kong insects and uh, I think I think Marco described. 
So Marco, uh, maybe you let everybody in and we can start now and maybe we can try again in another three minutes. I think uh, so far, that's everybody. I don't see anyone coming in so far. Okay, so let's, let's start. Okay. Um, let's get this thing up and load it. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a good time. Hope you're staying safe, staying healthy and staying happy, I guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, so today I'll be talking about the beauty of Hong Kong insects and spiders. Now originally it was just insects, but I talked to Benita and said that if I'm going to talk about invertebrates in Hong Kong, there's no way I can't talk about spiders because I think that Hong Kong spiders are really interesting as well. So uh, we discussed and we decided to add that in as well. So the main things that I'm going to be sharing, sharing with you guys is uh, common and unique insects in Hong Kong. So mainly these are animals that I've seen uh, through past years of me just going out to different nature reserves and different hike paths and just seeing different insects. And number two, I'll be talking about where to find them if you're interested to go out and find them for yourself. And number three is some uh, general and easy ways of identifying different insects and spiders and some of the ways that we can protect them. Now, I, now insects may be considered one of the more uh, non-significant organisms because they're little, they're tiny, and people sometimes find them disgusting, but they do play an important part in the ecosystem. So I'm gonna briefly talk about it later. So just a little introduction to myself. Uh, like I said, my name is Marco, and uh, I'm, I'm a secondary school student graduating this year. And my main interests are insects, spiders, and reptiles. So reptiles and amphibians, I also really like these kinds of animals. And for the past one to two years, I've been focusing on wildlife and macro photography with a Big camera like you see holding like you see me holding in the photo so this is this photo was taking taken uh, about in 5 a.m in the morning uh, uh, so I was going out trying to see if I could find some sleeping insects some butterflies and I, ha I think I have a few pics from that trip so I can share with you later so what do I hope to achieve in this presentation number one to show you some of my findings that I find memorable and unique I've been looking for insects for five years and across these five years, I have seen some of the more common insects. I've seen some of the more weird spiders. And some of them I would consider a bit rare. And all of them come in different shapes and colors. And every encounter is extre extremely memorable to me. But today I would like to pick out a few of the highlights. And number two is to raise awareness on these critters. Like I said before, the public has a bad uh, impression on these little animals. They think that they're grotesque and they're horrifying, but hopefully through this presentation, through my photos, I hope that we can change a bit of this image. We can see that insects are not the grotesque monsters that, that sometimes are portrayed on television, but they are actually kind of beautiful and kind of cute. So before we get into the pictures and the species, let's talk about something a bit general. Now Hong Kong, even though it's called the urban jungle, the concrete jungle, it has a plethora of animals and a very rich biodiversity. If you see this picture, I, I think it's from AFCD. Uh, Hong Kong actually has numerous species, but I'm just gonna zoom in on the insects here. Uh, there are about 124 dragonflies and about 236 butterflies. Again, considering the small size of Hong Kong, you've, if you're finding species with three digit numbers, that's a big number in terms of the size of Hong Kong. But the thing is, not all insects are properly documented in Hong Kong. AFCD, even now, even until now, the website only shows dragonflies and butterflies, but other insects and spiders uh, like mantises or weavers, not really well documented on the official page. So here I would like to just, just do a quick quiz. How many insects and spiders do you think currently reside in Hong Kong? I'm just gonna talk, I'm just, I'm just gonna talk about the described species. So you have four options here. One is about 4,000, about 5,000, about 6,000, and around 7,000. So you can make your guess in, in the chat. So I can just see. Uh, sorry, uh, Marco, can you just make sure uh, everybody is let in? If okay, anybody is let me, let me see. Yeah. Oh, so far, no, 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 no one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Let's see. Okay. So it's around, so from what I'm seeing right now, the numbers are around 
5,000 to 6,000. Um, now, the number may shock you a bit. And I, it shocked me as well when I finished some of the counting. But actually, hold up, uh, let's put this aside. It's around 7,000 species of insects and spiders combined. And we're still just talking about the described species. Now, according to some websites and according to a bit of my counting, there are about 7,029 species of insects and spiders in Hong Kong. That's at least 6,784 species of insects and around 245 species of spiders. That is a big number, more than the amount of reptiles in Hong Kong, more, the amount of, more than the amount of birds in Hong Kong, and more than the amount of frogs in Hong Kong. So in terms of insects and spiders, there is an incredibly rich diversity and there's actually so much to find, but because of their small size, they usually just go unnoticed or people just don't, they don't really care about them when they hide. So they're usually dismissed. So in terms of insects and spiders, uh, here we'd like to get into some kind of scientific and technical term stuff. Now insects and spiders are what we call arthropods. Now, arthropods are invertebrates, that means they don't have a backbone. But what's unique about arthropods is that they have segmented legs and they have an exoskeleton. So, for example, if you look at this tarantula picture, you can see that there are segments towards each leg. So, around three segments, and there's around two segments on the body. So, that's the, that's the cephalothorax, and that is the abdomen. I'll talk about it a bit a bit later. So, but there's one thing to keep in mind. Arthropods, all arthropods are invertebrates, but not all invertebrates are arthropods. If you look at animals like uh, centipedes and maybe fleas, they are invertebrates as well because they lack a backbone, but they are not, arthropods, they are not arthropods because some of them don't even have an exoskeleton, some of them don't even have uh, segmented legs and cannot be classified within the arthropod group. And insects and spiders are split into two. So insects, they diverge around here. So that includes maybe wasps and bees and ants. And spiders split around here. So spiders are what we know as arachnids. So animals with eight legs. I'll talk about a bit of that later. So after some of the technical stuff, so we move on to some uh, common and unique insects and spiders that, that I've, I've encountered over the past few years. Now, some of the species I've seen but didn't actually have a chance to get a good pick. So I borrow some from my friends and, I'll, and you can just check their pictures out in the credit section. So butterflies, uh, in my opinion, are the most appreciated of all insects because they're colorful, they're vibrant, and they don't chase you around trying to eat you. Um, uh, so they're really one of the most beautiful insects in Hong Kong. And because the, 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 of their size, they can, they can hardly be missed. So these are two of the species that I find memorable. One is the common rose, and the other is the white dragon tail. Uh, but I have to make a correction there. Are these two sort of the common species in Hong Kong? Not quite. But uh, these, two, these two species of butterflies are some, things, uh, some species that I've seen before. And the thing is, uh, both of these butterflies are classified as swallowtails. Now, the reason why is because you see on the wingtip here, there is this protrusion, this, this so-called tail coming out of the wingtip. And you can see in the, in the case of the white dragon tail, it's actually very long. And this is only seen in the white dragon tail. But in, but in other swallowtails like this common rose, it's usually rather short. But swallowtails are also one of the more colorful species of butterflies. And other species of butterflies, you have the common birdwing, which is one of the largest species of butterflies in Hong Kong. And you have this really common uh, red-based gazebo. Now, earlier I mentioned I went out at about 5 a.m. in the morning trying to look for insects. Now, this actually is one of the insects I found. The reason why I could take this pic is because it was still in the morning. And like us, insects actually do sleep. So you see this butterfly is actually sleeping on a leaf. And when sun rises, it gets the energy from the sun then it can actually go out and move. And another, now this is a smaller species of butterfly, but one also really common in Hong Kong is the purple sapphire. Now the, main, the name may seem misleading, as you see, it's more of a orangish and reddish color. But uh, when it opens its wings, you can see that the backside is actually a very beautiful purple color, which is why it gets its name. 
Now onto something similar to butterflies, which is moths. Uh, they can be easily misidentified, but I'll talk about that later. So here you have a false tiger moth, uh, which is a very, very common species. If you go to almost any hiking path, or maybe, during, maybe during the evening or at night, you'll see the species of moth. And they are identified with these beautiful yellow and black spots. And because of their large size, they're easily to see. And speaking of large sizes, this is the atlas moth. Now, if I was to give you a scale of how big this moth is, if this is the size of my hand, this is my hand stretched to the limit, the wingspan of this moth is even bigger than this. This is actually the biggest moth in Hong Kong and one possibly one of the biggest moths in Asia. And actually has a nickname called the cobra moth because you see on the wingtip here, it kind of looks like a cobra hood, doesn't it? You can see the head here and this is kind of the hood. So that, that's how it get, gets its nickname, the cobra moth. And you can see on this moth some very vibrant colors as well. And dragonflies are also one of the more well-known species. That's why they're, they're pro prominently documented on the, on the AFCD website. And, you, and they also come in very beautiful colors as well. They're not really the dull colors that sometimes you see in books. Now here you have a globe skimmer. Again, this is a sleeping dragonfly. So that's why it, got, it became so still. You can see an array of colors here. And this is actually a more memorable encounter. This is actually a, a quite small species of dragonfly called the Asian pintail, but it is the only dragonfly that I've seen so far that has a full blue color. Usually in other dragonflies, it may be blue, or maybe, uh, sorry, it may be green, maybe yellow, maybe a bit red, but never have I seen a dragonfly that has a full blue color. If there are any other species of dragonfly that I maybe have not encountered, you can, uh, you can type in the chat section because I would like to learn a bit more as well. And this is uh, the lesser emperor. You can see, I think these two are mating. So they kind of form a little heart shape, uh, which is really cute and romantic. And onto damselflies, again, they're similar to dragonflies, but there are several differences between them. Uh, this is one of my most favorite damselflies, damsel, yeah, damselfly species in Hong Kong. This is called the Chinese green wing, or as I used to call it before, I gave it a nickname called the jade damselfly because it is the only damselfly in Hong Kong that has this jade, shiny color. And you don't really see that in other damselflies. So this is probably one of the coolest damselflies I've seen. And this is called the orange face sprite. As you can see, that's how it gets its name because the face here is kind of red, uh, kind of orange. But also besides of orange, it does show a color combination of blue and green, which is probably one of the more colorful damselflies I've seen. And beetles, now beetles, we're starting to move on to some of the lesser known and less appreciated insects in Hong Kong. This is probably the most common tiger beetle in Hong Kong, but also one of the most beautiful. It's called the golden spotted tiger beetle. Uh, you can see them around in Lung Fu Shan or just anywhere that has a nature reserve. The reason why this is probably one of the most beautiful is because it has this reflective color of blue and you've got white spots, you've got the red, which is not really seen in other tiger beetles. Other tiger beetles usually have a more dull color of brown or black. But in this case, in this insect, it's not. And also one thing to note about tiger beetles is that number one, they are some of the fastest insects in the world. And number two, they're actually carnivores. They actually actively hunt down other insects and prey on them. And a little more, a little more uh, calm beetle is this yellow ladybird. Now, the reason I find, find this very memorable, because usually if we think of ladybirds, we think of these red and black ladybirds with spots on its wings. But in this case, it's not. It's a full yellow color with no spots. And it's actually, I actually nicknamed it the four-eyed ladybird because you can see it kind of has four eyes here. One interesting thing to note about this ladybird is when I was trying to identify this species, I went online and did a bit of searching. And actually, this species seems to be, like the first record of this species is actually in Hong Kong. It's not endemic, but the first record of this species is actually in Hong Kong. Another really interesting beetle is this oriental tortoise beetle. And the reason why I love this beetle so much is that the, if you see the tip here, it's kind of transparent. So you can actually see the legs and the leaf as well, but it still incorporates that very beautiful color that is not really seen in most beetles. And now we go on to some weirder looking beetles. Now this is a click beetle. The reason I the reason that it gets its name is because sometimes it makes this clicking sound. Now, why it makes this clicking sound, I'm not too sure at the moment. Uh, but the body shape is more slender, unlike the beetles before, which were more round in shape. 
And this one's probably the weirdest beetle I've seen. It's a Sadar beetle. And for those who understand Cantonese, the re it, if I translate straight from Cantonese, it's called a fan horn beetle. If I translate straight from Cantonese, but it's not really called that. The reason why it's called fan horn is because of these. The antenna, unlike the, unlike the click beetle, which is more straight, has, this, has multiple protrusions and looks kind of like a fan. And to be honest, these are not actually called horns. They're called antennas, which they use, insects use to detect scent. And these are, so I'm going to show a bit of ants, bees, and wasps as well, but I'm just going to group them into one big technical term. Uh, ants, there are many species of ants in the world. And in Hong Kong, ants are getting more and more famous because of some of the research done in HKU. If you've seen the news, you have, they have some new species of ants being discovered. Uh, but those are very, very small. And I haven't got the chance to see them, and they're very rare as well. So I'm just going to go with a bit more of the common ones. Now, this is an Asian jumping ant. It's one of the weirder looking big ants in Hong Kong because of the mandible here. You see it's like two long swords. Unlike usual ants, we had very short mandibles. And the, and the thing about this type of ant, like the name suggests, is that it actually jumps around. Usually ants just crawl, but this one actually jumps to gain mobility sometimes. And this is a more memorable photo I've seen, uh, I've taken in the past. It's a carpenter ant. Uh, you can find them around Tai Cao at night. They will just be wandering around some of the twigs or leaves. And I found this one uh, grasping its uh, larva in its mouth. Because usually, when, when you see something like this, it's a sign that they're moving nests. They're moving to a different nest. So they're carrying the larva. They're going to be carrying the queen. And so I found this very hardworking ant transporting its next generation. It kind of reminds us, reminds me of humans, like the busy pace of humans in the big city. I think there's some more people coming. Sorry, I'm pausing a bit. Okay. Now this photo was recent and probably one of my more, most favorite photos ever taken and probably an insect that I really wanted to see. This is a blue banded bee. Now you may be thinking, you see bees everywhere. Whenever there's flowers, there's bees. Why did I want to find this species of bee specifically? Now, one thing is because this bee has these blue bands on the abdomen uh, that you, you can't really see around. If you look at honeybees, they're usually uh, a bit of a yellowish, dark yellowish and black. You don't really see any other color like that. And another reason I wanted to see this bee is because of what it's doing. So in the chat section, can anyone guess what this bee, what this bee is doing? Just type out a guess. Let's see. Robin, you're yeah, mute. I don't know what you're speaking. I saw you were mumbling something. No, it wasn't for everyone. I was just uh, an aside to Serene. Uh, uh, catching prey, no. But sleeping, yes. Now, bees like this blue banded bee, they, 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 have, they have nests. But sometimes not everyone gets to the nest in time. So when some of these bees, they're wandering around, but when they can't get to the nest at night, they will just find a random twig, a random blade of grass, and bite on it to sleep. So it's kind of like if we're traveling and our car got stuck, so we temporarily get, find a hotel to sleep in. It's sort of like the case of these bees. So uh, a tip to photographers, if you don't want to find bees moving around, uh, moving around really quickly and you find it hard to photograph them, maybe go out at night and try to look for blades of grass, and you may actually see some of these bees sleeping. Oh, wait. Sorry. And another group of insects that's similar to bees are wasps. But I'm not going to show those usual, the wasps that we usually see maybe in school, or you see building nests around buildings. These are some of the more peculiar wasps I've seen. Uh, they're not like any of the usual wasps that you usually see. For example, this eucharitic wasp. The name is weird, but this wasp, the reason why this wasp is really cool, because number one, the antenna, you don't really see this kind of antenna on any wasp. And also the body shape looks a bit contorted, looks a bit weird. Now, this wasp uh, doesn't build a nest, or it doesn't build like a big nest, because this wasp, like this orange-legged wasp here, is a parasitic wasp. What this means is that they will find different insect hosts. So for example, the eucalyptic wasp actually finds a specific species of ants, it targets one of those ants, and it lays an egg in them. 
And so what the egg does is that as it grows, it starts to eat the ants from the inside. It's a bit horrifying, it's a bit gruesome, yeah. But this is actually how the life cycle of these insects go. So they eat the ant from the inside, and when they're fully grown, they emerge from the ant as a wasp, and then they will seek out other hosts to lay their eggs in. It's a gruesome process, but if you look at it from a insect lover and from an animal lover's perspective, it's actually a really beautiful cycle. And this is a species I've actually found in school. This is an orange-legged wasp. You can see how to get this name. And I can't really see it from my screen here, but you can see there's a, that long needle is what we call an overposter. So that's how it lays its eggs in other insects. So other insects I've seen, this is probably one of the more famous ones in Hong Kong. It's called a lanternfly. Now lanternflies are not related to fire, fireflies. Uh, they're actually related to plant hoppers. Uh, I have a picture later I can show you. The reason why it's called a lanternfly is because when people first discovered it, they thought that this red part of, of its head can actually uh, emit light like a firefly, but turns out, sadly, it cannot. It's just a, a really, really big plant hopper. And this is probably one of the more famous insects around the world, due, maybe due to its uh, portrayal in Kung Fu Panda. This is a mantis, a giant Asian mantis to be specific. And they're actually quite curious creatures. So if you put it on their hand, they actually look at you for a bit and they'll start exploring your hand, which is something really fascinating and really intriguing about these insects. And other interesting insects like the shield bug. Now shield bugs are interesting because if you look at the back here, like some of these shield bugs actually, the pattern form a face. So this kind of has a creepy smiley face to it. Uh, and you usually don't see that in other insects. So this is something that it's weird, but kind of interesting to me. And this is a green cicada. Uh, cicadas are known for them being really loud and noisy during the summer. And the, the reason why they buzz that much is because they're out to find mates. Because they usually stay dormant, they grow underground for a long period of time, and then they merge all together. So all the cicada nymphs all merge together. So they have to race against time to find a mate. So that's why they generate such a loud sound to attract more females. So now we're moving on to spiders, but first I would like to talk about uh, a, a really famous group of spiders, not just in Hong Kong, but around the world. These are jumping spiders. Now you may know jumping spiders because of the film Lucas. Now Lucas is that little cartoon of that baby plush spider that you see online. And, and the inspiration for that spider actually comes from these guys, the big googly eyes and the jumping motion. They're only found in these guys. Now, first of all, a caterpillar mimic jumping spider. Now, this spider was recently described in 2018, so it's a relatively new species, and it is named after the author of the Very Hungry Caterpillar. The reason why it gets its name is because it has this many tufts of hair growing up in the body and a very long abdomen. So actually, scientists believe that this species of spider is actually trying to uh, mimic lichen, lichen moth caterpillars, so a spider trying to pretend to be a caterpillar. And it's, it's a really unique form of mimicry in Hong Kong, which I'll talk about mimicry a bit later. Another mimic is this beetle mimic jumping spider. Uh, I don't really have a, I have a clear photo on why it's called a beetle mimic, because the body is relatively flat and round like a beetle. And this is probably one of the more beautiful jumping spiders. This is a jade jumping spider. Uh, you can see there's a, there's a lot more color than these two. So you've got blue, you've got some red, a bit of purple. And also, here's a question. Now you see, there's tufts of hair growing out from, from the limbs here. So I, I would like all of you to make a guess on, you can guess if this is a male or female. For which agenda you have to try to explain, to guess why it has grown such hairs. And this is only for, th this feature is only found in jumping spiders and not in any other spider in the world. So you can try and guess. what these hairs are for, and it's, it's male or female. So I've seen two, fem two females. Um, so yes, this is actually a male jumping spider, but the reason why it grows these hairs not because it's colorful. This species is generally colorful. No matter in both males and females, they have this beautiful rare color. But yes, the hair is for attracting mates. If, if you go online and search peacock jumping spider, you will see these jumping spiders from Australia that have this beautiful abdomen and a kind of a funny dance to attract mates. 
Now, yes, all jumping, all jumping spiders, all male jumping spiders, they perform a little bit of a dance to get the female's attention and attempt to mate. But the gruesome thing is, if the female isn't interested, it will actually eat the male. It won't just go on, it will actually eat the male. So the male only gets one chance of mating. But the, if, if, if you go online later and you search peacock jumping spider mating, mating you will see some beautiful, pic, beautiful videos from Australia and they're actually some of the most interesting and unique features of jumping spiders. And now we're going on from some small spiders to a bit, some, some spiders that are a bit big. This is a spiny orb weaver. Uh, it is the only spider of its kind in Hong Kong. The, the unique feature is these distinctive spines on the, on the abdomen, which are not really seen in other spiders. Like for example, these two, you don't really see these spikes. Uh, and you may think that they're soft to the touch, but I've, I've touched one of these and they're actually hard. They're sharp, they won't, they, won't, they won't make you bleed, but these spikes are actually really hard and really sharp. And another really beautiful spider is this silver leukage uh, with this beautiful pattern. And actually, if you, look to, if you sometimes see this spider in the wild and you look to the side, there's actually a bit of green here, but this is a, it's got, it's got some of a silvery reflective color, so that's how it gets its name. And this one is one of the spiders I most adore. It is a garden spider. And the reason why I adore this, if you look at the abdomen here, it kind of looks like a hat from Harry Potter, doesn't it? It kind of looks like a witch's hat. Now, why it gets this feature, uh, again, I don't really know, but it is something very unique to the spider and how it gives its identity away. So that was just some of the insects and spider species that I've seen in the past. So now, uh, so some of you may be interested saying that, oh, these, these animals are really cool. Maybe I want to go out to find them myself. But they're such small animals. So where will I try to find them? So I'm going to share with you a few tips and a few locations. So number one, which may come surprising, handrails. Now you may think handrails are a man-made structure. So animals usually won't tend to it. But for insects and spiders, handrails in Hong Kong uh, have created the very unique and perfect habitat. If you think of some of maybe like the East Highway, the West Highway, these handrails actually act as highways for insects to travel from one place to another. So you see, here's a, here's a huntsman spider traveling, and you see here's a, here's a mantis snake traveling. So they use handrails to get from one place to another. And this feature, I think is really unique in Hong Kong because to some of the places I've been to, you don't have much handrails in country parks. Only Hong Kong, has that many handrails, and with handrails comes a large number of insects. And to be honest, from when I was S2 to about S4, all I've been looking for, like the only place I've been looking for insects is actually just handrails. And I found more species of insects and spiders up that I can count on my hands. So it's more than 10. So that's actually a really big number. And also, you, you see this point here of using the entire handrail. Now, what does this actually mean? So not only do insects and spiders, they use the handrail to travel, sometimes they, they, spiders build webs on the underside, uh, some insects shelter on the underside, and some jumping spiders. I think I've seen one using a handrail, using the bottom to ambush its prey, which was on the lower part of the handrail, and actually jumping down to eat its prey. So insects, have, insects of Hong Kong have adapted to use handrails to their own advantages. And here's another more obvious place to find insects, which is plantation. So maybe uh, stems, leaves, flowers. Now, one thing that insects use these for is for nymphs. Like nymphs are, are, are kind of like baby insects. So after, they, after they, they hatch from the eggs, which are usually attached to the plants, they use the plants for shelter and food, like this little uh, plant hopper nymph right here. Uh, he's, this one was actually found in Hoi Ha Wan, a trip led by Benita uh, some time ago. And it was, one of the, it was one of the more cute insects that I've seen on that trip. And the, a, a bit of a tip, tip here is that this insect is actually, I nicknamed it the snowflake insect, the snowflake bug. The reason why is the protrusion here kind of looks like a snowflake, but not actually weird. They're actually made of wax, wax and silk, not actually snow. And also, it is a place for mating for insects. So you see these, these two tortoise beetles here, they're actually mating on, this, on a plant. Now, the advantages of mating on a plant not in, out in the open is because uh, you won't have much predators 
uh, disturbing your mating process. So it, so it kind of keeps them safe during the mating process. Uh, speaking of hiding from predators, they are good hiding spots under the leaves. But also, it's, speaking of plantation, you have flowers, right? And so it may, insects like hoverflies, bees, and butterflies, they, they, they will help to pollinate these flowers. And pollination is a very important part that insects play in the ecosystem because they help to distribute seeds and they help to disperse the population of plants. I think you've seen the news uh, before saying that US is now facing a bee crisis because the number of bees are dying out and there's not enough bees to help to pollinate the crops and maintain the food economy. So not only are insects important to the ecosystem, they're actually some of the fundamental basis for our own economy as well. And another place you may find them is tree trunks. Now some, some insects, like this two-tailed spider here, use, this, use the tree trunk for ambush. So as you can see the spider here, you can hardly make out where the spider is because it is perfectly camouflaged against the tree trunk, against the bark and the moss. And so when unsuspecting prey comes along, it doesn't see the spider laying on the tree trunk and it will, it will be eaten. So sometimes insects are camouflaged against the tree trunk, so maybe you could see if something's moving on the, on the tree trunk over there. And they're actually also a food source for some beetles, like this logical beetle that I found some time ago who was eating away some of the bark because barks are some, some of the main food sources of, of logical beetles. Another place to find them is near water sources, uh, like big ponds and lakes and puddles. I'll explain why, why puddles are included as well. So for big ponds and lakes, you'll probably see uh, dragonflies and damselflies flying around. They sometimes mate, and like I've said before, damselflies and dragonflies, when they mate, they create this unique heart shape, which is, which is, a, which is kind of cute and very romantic. And also, now I mentioned puddles a bit earlier. Now why can insects be found near puddles? Because puddles, after rain, they actually serve as a drinking source for insects. Like insects, they, 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 they're, they're us, they're animals, so they need to constantly hydrate themselves. And you see like this butterfly found this very little pool of water. And I don't know if you can see here, you, you can make out this kind of, sort of hair, hair like thing. Now this is not actually a hair, this is the mouth part of the butterfly, it's called a proboscis. So it, it, it's right now it's helping the butterfly to drink water and when it's near flowers, it actually helps the butterfly to suck in the nectar. So this, is, this requires a bit more patience. So you can sometimes find insects and spiders under rocks or logs, like this termite nest over here. They, they, they build nests or hide to care for the offspring, offspring and to hide from predators. And sometimes rocks and logs can provide shelter for nocturnal animals, like this tarantula here. It may come to a surprise, but actually there's actually one species of tarantula in Hong Kong, which is this garden tarantula. It's not as big a, as the Goliath bird eater or some of the other tarantulas you see online, but having, a having Hong Kong's very own tarantula is pretty cool. It's not endemic, but it's still a pretty cool thing to find if you put under the rock. And some good places to look in, uh, in Hong Kong to look for them. Now, I will have to admit, because of past schoolwork, I haven't been able to go to many different places. So I've only been to a select few uh, uh, repeatedly. So these are some of the places I, I repeatedly visit. Uh, this is Taipo Kao. Uh, it is one of the more famous nature reserves in Hong Kong. And they're famous for fireflies there, even though I haven't really seen much. You can find many beetles, um, many spiders there. And it's a really cool place. Bong Yun is another really famous place in Hong Kong because it is a dedicated butterfly reserve. So this place, because of its uh, high diversity of butterflies, high density of butterflies, uh, the government actually classified it as a nature reserve. So if you go there, uh, although you may need to pay a bit of money, you can find many different species of butterflies there, even some of the rarer ones in Hong Kong. In Bok Bulam Country Park, uh, I visited quite recently. It's also the place where I took the picture of that sleeping bee. So there are many different species of insects and many different species of spiders. And on a side note, it is also a very good place to see some frogs and snakes, including uh, the endangered uh, short-horn toad, which is a, a endangered species of amphibian in Hong Kong, and they can sometimes be found in this area. So if you go out and you see some of these insects, so how do I know which insect is which? And, and how are the ways that I, I, as a normal citizen, can detect them? So I'll talk about the identification first. So like I said at the very, very beginning, before I introduce any of the species, insects and arachnids 
are classified into two different groups. So, uh, because I sometimes I see online that people usually mix up the few, saying that, oh, are spiders insects? In fact, they're not. So if we use this diagram to help you, uh, you can see that insects, they're actually classified, they're actually separated into three different segments. The head is here. The, this is what we call the thorax. And then this is the abdomen. The abdomen is usually where you find these beautiful stripes and like stain in case of this wasp. And also a very uh, easy way to identify insects is they have six legs. So like this ant here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and three segments. And that's how you identify it as an insect. As for spiders, uh, they only have two segments. This is the cephalothorax, or if we're, if we're making things easy to understand, we'll call it the head. And they have an abdomen. They, don't, they lack the thorax, so it's just the head and then the abdomen. And also an easy way to identify spiders that they have eight legs. So let's use an example. This is a false widow spider that I found in school. So again, let's do a bit of a count of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight legs and two segments on the body and that's how we classify it as a spider. And also spiders have wings. So, I mean, I'm grateful for that. If I see a spider with wings, I won't probably say run to photograph it, I'll probably want to run away even though I'm really fond of these animals. Uh, so we're now going to a bit more confusing stuff. Uh, these are some common mix-ups that sometimes uh, people online get and sometimes even I get. So here is a picture of a damselfly and a dragonfly. Now, one thing to identify these, these two insects is the head shape. These kind of have like that hammerhead shark shape, but these have more big eyes than compared to a damselfly. If, you don't, if, if the head shape is kind of confusing and hard to describe, we can also look at the wings. Dragonflies, when they rest, they have their wings spread out like this. But for damselflies, they usually have their wings closed. Well, you can't really see it here. But when damselflies uh, rest, they, their wings are closed, no matter if they're resting or mating or eating their prey. Yes, damselflies are actually carnivorous. Their wings are closed. But for dragonflies, their wings are usually kept wide open. Another really uh, more found mix-up is between butterflies and moths. Some of these look very similar, but I chose two very distinct ones to help you, to help the identification. Now, you, you, now, if we talk about wings, when they rest, they usually have their wings closed. So it's really hard to say if, if the wings close, it is, a, is it a moth or a butterfly? So the, the way that I used to uh, identify butterflies and moths is with the antenna. So with the butterfly here, it's a rather more thin antenna, but with this moth here, uh, you can see it's, cut, it's not thick, it is more feathery than a moth, uh, than a butterfly, sorry. So usually those with feathery antennas, they're moths, and those usually with more thin, stalky uh, antennas, they're usually butterflies. Now the reason moths have these feathery features, this is based on some reading and some, and some of my own assumption, is because moths, they fly at night. So when they fly at night, they, they can't really see because it's pitch black. Insects aren't, uh, like moths aren't known for their eyesight. So what happens to a moth if you can't, you can't really see, but you're in desperate of food and you have really short time to find a mate? So these feathery antennas actually help the moth to detect scent, to guide its way through the forest and see where the food source is, and it actually helps to detect pheromones from the opposite sex, so it's easier to find a mate and reproduce. Uh, so let's go on to an even, even more confusing part of identifying insects, which is identifying a mimic. Now, I've talked about mimics briefly before, so what a mimic is, is that it is an animal pretending to be another animal. So in this case of this fruit fly, it is a fly, but with the shape here, it kind of looks, the shape and color, it kind of looks like a wasp. It's not like the usual house flies we see around our houses. So here we have another really common mimic, which is an ant mimicking jumping spider and a spiny ant. So I want you to try and guess this. So let's label this, the spider as A, and let's label the spider as B. Which, which do you think is mimicking which? Do you think A, is mimicking B, or do you think B is mimicking A? So I'd just like to see in the chat, see what your guesses are. Mm. 
yes, so far everyone is correct. It is actually the spider mimicking the ant because ant, they can sometimes be very aggressive. Uh, so a spider mimics an ant, maybe in terms of self-defense. It usually, uh, yes, the, the Chinese name kind of gives it away. Uh, it, it, oh, sorry, wrong button. They usually mimic the ants in terms of self-defense, even though they're spiders and they contain venom. And not only does the appearance mimic the ant, if you can see it kind of has this like long mandible, which kind of mimics the ant's head and a, and a sort of ant-shaped abdomen, but also with this legs right here. Now, if you see these ant mimicking jumping spiders around in the handrails, you will see them waving the two, these two legs around here. They're doing this not to attract attention, they're doing this not to attract a mate. Well, sometimes they do, but usually, is to mimic the ant's antenna. Because if you see ant's antenna, they're like moving around like that. So, but spiders don't have antennas. So these legs, with their, waving, with their wavy motion, they're actually trying to mimic a ant's antenna and trying to make uh, the mimic more, more believable. And this is, more, this is a bit more mimics because mimics are a very interesting topic if in terms of insects. So here we have a cortisin butterfly and here we have a crow butterfly. So again, let's do a guessing game. Uh, one of these two butterflies is poisonous. If you think A is poisonous, you can type A. If you think B is poisonous, then you can type B. So I'd like to see your guesses. So, so far we have half the, half the people who answer think that this is poisonous and half the people who answer who think that this is poisonous. The answer is the crow. The crow actually is a poisonous butterfly and there are actually several species of poisonous butterfly in Hong Kong. This, this butterfly, the cortisin, is not poisonous, but the wing pattern, you can see the spots here, the dark brown color, it's also bluish on the wing here, don't you can see it here. It actually tries, tries to mimic uh, the poisonous crow. Now what this, ah yes, uh, they look very alike. This is the purpose of mimic, is to look very, very similar to the thing you're mimicking. So if I'm an innocent butterfly through evolution, I would try to make myself look more like a poisonous butterfly. Now what this does is uh, it, avo it avoids you from being eaten by predators. So through evolution, when a butterfly tastes, a, when a bird tastes, a, eats a crow, and they will think that, oh, this is poisonous, I'm not going to eat it again. And with the cortisin mimicking the crow, uh, the bird will think that this is actually a crow and avoid eating it. So that's actually how it does self-defense. And a really interesting fact about the cortisin, uh, I'll say a bit of a Chinese here. For those, uh, for those who don't understand, I'll try to translate in English. The, the Chinese name of the cortisin is called a mongapi. In English, uh, if you just directly translate, I'll call it a mango butterfly. The reason why it's called a mango butterfly, the name is kind of weird and funny, yes, because the eye here, can't, you can't, maybe you can't really see it though, it's yellow. And that's only, you can only find this yellow eye in these butterflies and not anything else. And this yellow eye, because people think that it kind of looks like a mango, hence it gets the Chinese name, mongapi. Now, so the past two slides I've talked about uh, insects mimicking insects or spiders mimicking insects, but sometimes it's not even mimicking arthropods at all. If you see this bird dropping spider, it's actually mimicking bird poo. And for this, uh, for this caterpillar here, it's called a spangled swallowtail caterpillar. It's mimicking something even weirder. You can see it kind of has these like, like uh, spots near the head. Now actually, these spots actually mimic eyes. So what this caterpillar is trying to do is actually mimicking a snake. Now, for those who know, there is a venomous snake in Hong Kong called the bamboo pit, bamboo pit viper. I'm not too sure if it's actually uh, necessarily mimicking the bamboo pit viper, but with the condition of a pit viper being, being in Hong Kong, I would think that this, the developing such spots near the head actually helps it see, and the green body color helps it seem more like an insect, uh, more like a pit viper than a caterpillar. Uh, so here's a bit more complicated. I'll try, to, I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly. So sometimes insects go to meta metamorphosis, which they change their body completely. So this is what we call complete metamorphosis. Let's see. So, okay. 
So here you see a caterpillar. So caterpillar is usually the longer, you have more types of hair. And when they form a cocoon and they, uh, through, uh, maybe, maybe a few days, a few weeks or so, they will transform into a moth. So moths have wings, but caterpillars don't. So that's a very, very easy, easy way to identify them. But sometimes they don't completely change their, their appearance at, at all. So with this mantis, you can see even as a nymph and as an adult, uh, they look pretty similar. The head shape's pretty similar. The color's really similar. The only difference that uh, uh, a mantis nymph has from an adult is that it lacks the wings, for starters, and it doesn't really have the sexual organs maturely developed. So this is what we call incomplete metamorphosis. So if you see a mantis without wings, it's usually a juvenile or sub-adult. And sexual dimorphism is also a, a very important thing when it comes to identifying insects. Because sometimes insects don't, look, don't just look similar. They are exactly the same, but only the minute features are different. So this is a dragonfly introduced, uh, introduced earlier. This is the Asian pintail. So, uh, so again, if this is A and this is B, which one is the male? So if you think A is the male, type A. If you think B is the male, type B. Now this is going to be a bit tricky. Okay, so most of people say A and there's some B, some who say B. And yes, the blue version of the Asian pintail is actually the male, while this yellower, light, maybe light blue color is actually the female. The reason why they have such different colors is because uh, insects see a different color spectrum than we do. So it actually helps them to, to, to see which one's the male and which one's the female. So, so, you, so they won't mate with the wrong gender. So after we are, we've known to identify different types of insects, the next step, the more important step, is protecting them. But some of you may say, well, insects are small, they reproduce quickly, so we don't need to, we don't need to conserve them that much. They will just, the population will just bounce back really quickly. But there are many unnecessary kills of insects. When I say kill, I mean out of fear. If you say killing mosquitoes, those don't count. I will, uh, the only thing I will kill in this world is a mosquito because I think their sole function is to annoy people, to annoy my sleep, and that's why we kill them whenever I see one, and I just hate them. And like I said, the reason we kill these animals is because we fear them. And the reason we fear them is because we know very little about them. I've said this before, but I'll say it again, because this is a very major reason why insects are usually killed. Because if you see in horror films or in cartoons, insects and spiders are portrayed as the bad guy. They're portrayed as grotesque monsters. And that image is imprinted onto our mind. So whenever we see an insect or a spider, we will think, yuck, disgusting, and we kill them. Uh, like this un uh, unlucky grasshopper right here. So in order to protect these insects, we're not scientists. We can't go out into the field, grab some insects, and do some scientific study on them. Uh, but as a normal citizen, I, he, I'm here to suggest some ways that we can protect them. So the main thing is to learn about insects. The more we learn about them, the more we know about them. The more we know about them, the more we can appreciate them, and the, more we can, but the less we fear them. So one thing, very easy, books and guides. You will find them in bookstores or online. So the, the, this is my very own collection. So I've got uh, books on Hong Kong insects, Hong Kong butterflies, Hong Kong spiders, and Hong Kong jumping spiders. And other books you can see, I've got bird books, I've got books about venomous snakes. I've got uh, Hong Kong reptiles and amphibians. And here are some overseas books, uh, 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 reptiles from Madagascar, some birds, and in general wildlife in Madagascar. These books, they help us learn. Through pictures, descriptions by experts, uh, we, will learn, we will learn more about an insect or spider's appearance and more about their behavior. And with that, we, we will, with, with more pictures and more exposure, uh, we will tend to fear them less. This is how I usually got into it because when I was back when I was like in a, ju a junior in secondary school, I was not that fond of insects. I was a bit scared, but I, uh, I bought some books, I read them and I went out and saw a few more 
and that fear gradually faded away. So this is one way that I've learned to cope. And I think this is a very easy way because these books and oops, sorry, these books and uh, these books and online papers are very easily accessible. And another thing, this is more mainstream, is social media because we see people using Facebook, we see people using Instagram, and I'll, I'll maybe count this social media as well. I'll talk about this as, uh, after after these two. So, like you see on Facebook, you have this uh, group designated for people to share their wildlife, so it's wildlife finds, and Instagram, the hashtag Hong Kong Wildlife, you can see many people posting different animals. Uh, for insects, I see a, a swallowtail butterfly. This is a rare species that, that has appeared recently. I don't know if you can still find them out there, but I would really, really like to see one. And this map brain photographed by a good friend of mine called Samuel, I'll, talk, I'll introduce him a bit later. So with these, with these online platforms, you share your experience and footage with other people with the same interests. And if there's some things that you don't understand, there are always people that know that, that know what you found. So you put it on these uh, platforms and they can also help you to identify and learn more about it. An important thing is document your findings, and share them online. Well, possibly not the location, but just share your findings and uh, share what you found to other people and also just gain a few more friends that have same interests. And with iNaturalist, I think this is a app that uh, Anita uh, uses on her, on her uh, eco tools and an app that I've started using again recently. So with this app, you can uh, know, again, not only you can document findings, but you can uh, go there and look at different species. So it is a more scientific version of the hashtag and the Facebook platform. And with iNaturalist, the benefit is because there are many scientific experts and researchers that are using this app as well. So you may not know, but your findings may actually aid scientists and researchers in their own scientific investigation. So one little contribution of a photo or video may help to the discovery of a new species or the understanding of a new species. So they're very vital and very important. But one thing I've always stressed uh, throughout, throughout this part is exposure. And the most, most important thing is going out to the wild and experience it for yourself. Hong Kong is not a big place. Not a big place. You just take the MCR or just drop, uh, take the bus, and you'll easily get you to the nearby nature reserve. This is a photo taken in February. It's in Taipo Cow, but it kind of looks like a rainforest. But the message I'm trying to uh, to tell you is that Hong Kong, like I said, has this very rich ecosystem, and there's many, many things to find. But sitting around at home, scrolling through your social media. Just, and just reading the books without much exercise is not enough and it's not healthy as well. So maybe pack a bag, go out with your friends and family and go to these hiking trails or, or, or nature reserves to see them for yourselves. Because without actually seeing these animals in action, there will still be a gap of uncertainty because, you, you will not, because books only have words and pictures. But going out there, you will see a real life animal with real life actions and some real life behavior. But in the end, the results of every single trip is not important. It is the process of putting effort, flipping through different rocks, looking around trees and leaves, and finding that insect, which is important. So in conclusion, I would like to like quote, quote, quote something. If all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment will collapse into chaos. Some people view insects as insignificant, but with this and the fact, and, and some of the facts of such as uh, bees pollination actually help the food economy, shows that insects play a very, very vital role in our ecosystems and within our human society. Yes, some may be, dis some may be disgusting to some people, some may be annoying, uh, but, Insects and spiders are equally as important as you and I. So with combined efforts, we need to learn to appreciate them. And through further appreciation, we should learn to conserve them. Aside from mosquitoes, you can kill, you can kill as many mosquitoes as you want because uh, they're, they're really, really annoying. I hate them. So, so um, yeah, I think the main message is get protect, as a learn, appreciate, and protect. So these are the main main takeaways from my five years of looking through these, looking looking at these animals, and something I'd like to share with you 
uh, today. And speaking of learning more, I would like to thank uh, Encompass, Encompass HK for inviting me to do this talk. I'm honored and privileged to be able to share my experience and photos with you guys. Now, Encompass is a social enterprise uh, whose work is trying to meet sustainability goals, and sometimes they organize these eco tours I've talked about before. So with this picture, uh, I recently, sorry, I recently went to Hoi Ha Wan, uh, who's, who, who's trip, whose tour was led by Benita. And although we're looking around mudflats here, we saw some mud skippers, we saw some crabs, but throughout, throughout the road, we also saw many butterflies, many spiders, and we also saw a frog, uh, which was really cool. And, and like I said before, it is the process of looking for these animals that's important. And whether or not you, you actually do find, it doesn't matter if you found something rare, it doesn't matter if you found a large number of species, but with the effort you put into looking for these animals, and maybe from the guidance of professionals like Belinda, uh, you will get to see some very interesting animals up front. And um, the more exposure you have, the more you will learn about them. And speaking of tours, uh, I'd mentioned Taipo Cow earlier, and there will be a night biodiversity tour in this, uh, uh, on the June of, 27th of June from 7 to 10, and I will be helping to guide uh, participants to, uh, to look around Taipo Cow. Now Taipo Cow is, like I said, it's famous for, uh, famous for fireflies, and there also the other insects as well. Now I found all these three in one night. I found this very beautiful slug caterpillar, which is actually unidentified in Hong Kong. Like, many, like not, many, not too many people are still sure of what this species of caterpillars belong. And I also found some centipedes. Well, they're, they're not technically insects and spiders, but there are some really cool arthropods, although they're sort of dangerous. Uh, but I found five to six centipedes in one night, and I only spent a few hours walking through this, about the same trail. So it's actually a really cool find as well. And another animal you might see besides some insects and spiders are frogs. And this is a green cascade frog. Uh, this is a male one because males are usually smaller because due to sexual dimorphism. And it is one I found near a stream. So uh, uh, it is possible to see these amphibians there as well. So like I said, the date is June 27th. It will be my first guided tour, the first tour I will ever guide it, ever guide. And if you're interested, you can apply on Evanbright or you can ask Benita and I for more details. So if you're interested, you can come. And hopefully I'll see you there. And, and last but not least, if, you, if you'd like to see more photos of mine, you can follow my Instagram. Uh, the name is right here. Uh, that underscore B, that underscore guy. And uh, I'll be posting different insects and spiders that I found, not only just in Hong Kong. Uh, I've been to Madagascar as well. I'll be posting some of those later. And uh, so I, I just, uh, so it's going to be a regular update of my of my journey and my finds. So like right here, you have a green cicada, you have a cigar beetle, and this mud skipper that uh, we found on Benita's uh, eco tour to Hoi Ha Wang. So if you're interested in seeing what more animals I find, you can follow my Instagram right here. I also have a Facebook, but I don't really use it that much. So you can follow my Instagram here. So. At the end of this talk, I would like to thank a few people. First, first is Benita, Benita for inviting me to do this talk. It has been super awesome. It has been a super awesome experience and I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it from prepping this thing, going out to take more pictures, to presenting it to you guys. It has been fun. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Lee, uh, I would also like to thank him as well. Now, if you don't know, Benita, uh, for those who were in the chat room earlier, Benita introduced a book. Uh, it's a Cantonese book talking about Hong Kong invertebrates. That book was actually written by Dr. Lawrence Lee. Uh, he, uh, I talked to him for a bit and he has actually helped me to formulate uh, some, some parts of this presentation and given, given me some advice. I'd like to thank him for that. And also some photographers, I would like to thank them as well for, sharing, for letting me lend their pics, uh, Samuel, Gavin, and Bergman. So you can follow their social medias here for Samuel. It, it, his Instagram is at Wilderness Samuel. And for Gavin, uh, his Facebook is Gavin Lerm. He's an expert on butterflies. He, I think he knows every single species of butterfly in Hong Kong. So if you give him any picture, a clear picture, I think he will actually give you identity within seconds. And Bergman, Bergman underscore N, is a really good photographer of damselflies and dragonflies. So you can go check him out. And these are some of the books I've used to reference uh, to, some, to help me with some of the identifications. So the photographic guide to jumping spiders in Hong Kong, Guide to the Spiders of Hong Kong, Hong Kong Butterfly Guide, and a Photographic Guide to Hong Kong Insects. 
So if you're interested in reading these books, I think you can still find them in some bookstores. So do, do make sure to check them out. And yeah, that is the end of the sharing. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. It has been an absolute blast presenting to you guys. And hope you all have a wonderful day next day. Thank you. So uh, Marco, before we leave, I think there's a, a, a few questions. Uh, so uh, uh, Jess asked, what is your opinion on macro photography aids such as the Raynox lens? I have no idea what that is. Wait, let me see where's the question. Uh, Jess, at 9.05 p.m. She has a question for you. 9.05 p.m. Oh, what is your opinion on macro, macro photography aids such as the Raynox lens? Now, I personally have a Raynox. Wait, just give me a sec. I'll bring it to you. Just give me a sec. Uh, okay, so in the meantime, I do want to share. So uh, Marco uh, was mentioning iNaturalist earlier. Uh, so this is a concept for citizen science. So every one of us can record a uh, species. And I, so, uh, um, sorry, sorry, Marco, let me, let me finish. So I, I want to uh, say, uh, uh, Marco was saying moth earlier. So I know some researchers in Hong Kong, you actually, uh, because moth are not very easy for citing, so they actually use the iNaturalist data to do some of the distribution. So your data is important. It's not just for fun. Anyway, I finished. Michael, your turn. Okay. So this is the Raynox lens. So for those who don't know what this is, it's basically, so this is my camera. So this is a macro lens, which I use to take super close pictures of insects and spiders. And this is actually a, a, uh, a magnifying glass for the lens. It's like a clip. So I can use this to sort of clip onto the lens and it actually takes, helps me to take even closer pictures. So usually, I will, sometimes I will just take pictures of the body uh, but with this, I can actually take uh, some really close-ups on maybe the eye, the, the, the hexagonal shapes of the, each individual eye of a, of a dragonfly. So this actually helps out a lot. Now, if you're going for close-up macrophotography, I think this is something you will need in your bag. It's going to be very helpful. And I think in, uh, I mean, in terms of macrophotography, uh, depends on what you go for. If you're going for something aesthetic, then this is probably not the right choice. If you're going for something like close-up macros, like the pictures I've shown you, then because some of the pics I've shown you back then were, were, were taken with this lens, so I think this is going to be useful if you're doing close-up macro photography, and it can help you understand, it can help you see a very very different world other than the insect's body. You can maybe see the eyes, the legs, the abdomen pattern much more clearly with this lens, and maybe do a bit of editing. So I think yeah, it's really helpful. It's not really a hindrance. I think it's pretty helpful as well. Thank you, Marco. Any, any, oh, okay. So, Leanne, Leanne I have a question. Okay. Uh, how do you encourage, how do you engage with someone who wants to swap every <laughs> <laughs> Um, Now, uh, back in my school, I, I guess, but besides from a few, few of my friends, no one likes insects inspired. It's like every insect they see, they will try to kill them, uh, they will try to shoo it away. Uh, if shooting away, I get it, but killing, I think, is sort of the necessary. It is, in, it is, like, you don't have to kill an insect, seriously. Just let it, let it go and be all right. But uh, with, with people that usually have this kind of fear, um, I won't usually bring up the topic of insects and spiders. Like, I mean, sometimes I do share with them, but usually I don't want to invoke that fear because I can't help to to fully erase that kind of fear from your mind. It is your own efforts, something that you, you choose to do, and with further exposure, this fear will go away. So sometimes if, if in chats and something comes up, something similar comes up, I'll probably bring the topic up, but usually um, I won't really talk to them about insects and spiders because it's not something that they would want to hear and, and it will be very awkward if I talk, sometimes if I talk to them with someone that kind of fears them. And if they actually, because my school is located near mountains, so every now and then you will see uh, insects and spiders, even snakes coming to school. So sometimes my classmates will encounter such insects, and usually I'll, I'll if they will tell. Uh, my, 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 I'm fortunate for my classmates because uh, they don't really kill insects. So uh, I will just try to see where the insect is or where the spider is. I'll just get it away from them as quickly as possible and relocate it back to some plantation or near the mountains. So, yeah. Ooh, any more questions from anybody? Thank you, Leanne, for asking that. I think we need to increase the self-selected group and include more people who might like spider and uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, like 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 what Marco said. I think it's exposure. Like once once you know about it, uh, you will you will you will develop uh, not affection, but at least you you know that they are also important for biodiversity. Yes, and spiders. Um, just a note. Now you may think that sometimes you see spiders around your house, and you think that oh, disgusting. What well, I don't want a spider crawling into my ear at night. But actually, keeping a few spiders in your house is actually kind of beneficial, believe it or not. Because, like I said, there are some very, very annoying animals out there, like mosquitoes, like flies, and maybe sometimes cockroaches. And some of these spiders can actually help you eat some of, uh, eat some of the mosquitoes and flies that enter your house if, if they do get the chance. So, uh, so it's beneficial to them because they, get and eat, they, they use our houses to get a meal. And also it's beneficial to us because we wouldn't have to hear that annoying, annoying, loud buzz near our ear every night when a mosquito comes into the house. So yeah, I would say keeping some spiders in your house is beneficial, but don't, don't keep too much. Okay, any more questions? Uh, if not, can, can we uh, either clap in the, in, in the reaction or give a round of applause for, uh, for Marco for helping us? Uh, thank, thank you, Marco. Uh, Thank very you all so much for, for coming to listen. I wasn't, I, I wasn't yeah. expecting that many people to be honest. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Marco is a young student, but I think uh, you can all see that he's really passionate about insects and know a lot. Uh, so yes, uh, we'll be sharing the presentation to you after tonight. Uh, and uh, if you have any comments for us or any topics you want us to cover, maybe birds or something, uh, we try to find interesting speakers uh, that can share with us. Uh, so previously I have done, uh, I'm, I'm a marine biologist, so I'm very good with ocean stuff. I'm not good in insects, so that's Marco's job. So uh, we, we will be open to talk and anything in terms of biodiversity. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you as well. Thank you, and bye. Bye. I overran yo yo. <laughs> we, we, it's always over, easy to overrun in Zoom. It's very normal. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Hope you have yeah. a great day tomorrow. Yeah, you can stop the recording now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey. Wait, hold on. Okay. Hey, Benita, my mom wants to talk to you for a bit. Oh, okay. Hello. Sure. Hello, Auntie. Hello. 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 Oh, Corporate, 他說得的得的我知道的了我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他的我知道他